prices are steadily on the rise, the EV ecosystem is still underdeveloped, and as we recently discovered, the public charging infrastructure is nowhere near ready enough to take on the challenge of everyday and long-distance mobility. But it looks like the perfect solution to both these problems has been staring us in the face all this time. I'm talking, of course, about hybrid vehicles. Much like the all-new Honda City EHEV or Hybrid Electric Vehicle, now, hybrids have been around for over two decades, but in recent times, they've been sidelined in favor of zero emission EVs. And if you look at it, hybrids are that perfect union between internal combustion technology and electric technology joined in holy matrimony till death or draconian policies do them part. Now, the fact that Honda has launched a hybrid version of its best-selling car a locally assembled hybrid means that the technology could be making a big comeback. How does it differ from a standard city? Let me show you. The changes are fairly subtle, so we can run through them fairly quickly. You've got this blue border around the badge, a honeycomb grille, a black diffuser with carbon accents, which is a bit incongruous given the whole green hybrid vibe. But this car is sold in Thailand as the Honda City RS. And while they've gotten rid of all the other sporty embellishments to highlight the hybrid attributes, this is probably a remnant of that. Dual tone alloys, still not oversized and sized for comfort, but that pretty much along with a spoiler at the back, which kind of blends in with the, the boot lid, uh, all the visual changes there are. Uh, now let's take a look on the inside. Now changes on the inside are also pretty minimal. You've got this dual tone finish and uh, upholstery in ivory white. Not the most practical idea, so let's hope you're carrying wet wipes. Other than that, you have a electronic parking brake, which is the main difference, freeing up a bit of space here. You've got this econ button, and uh, what's missing, of course, is wireless Apple CarPlay and wireless charging, which is frankly shocking. It's also lamentable that it's missing ventilated seats, which is a luxury now affordable in cars cheaper than this one. Leg room on the whole hasn't been compromised, but what has been compromised is the boot space because, well, the battery had to go somewhere and in order to not compromise on the ground clearance, Honda has chosen to put it at the very back. So it's down by 200 liters uh, and also it doesn't get a full spare. So you get a space saver. But other than that, this is pretty much as comfortable as the city has always been. Front windshield mounted camera, it can detect an upcoming object and should the need be, apply the brakes for you. Of course, it does give you several warnings so that you can do that yourself and you are supposed to, um, you know, be active all the time. What you can't determine is the distance uh, that you get to set at which point the car, car's emergency braking act, acts up. Uh, that happens with, you know, bigger, more expensive cars, especially in Indian traffic. You can't really predict jaywalkers or, or just some motorcyclist cutting across and uh, normally that tends to send a car with, with very advanced ADAS into a state of panic where it just clamps down immediately and that can cause somebody from the back to hit it. Uh, there's nothing that intense here uh, and honestly it's not acted up but it would be nice to have that feature. All right, now that we've discussed all the trivial exterior and interior details, let's talk about what's underneath that bonnet and how all the tech inside this car works because to be perfectly honest it's not as straightforward as it is with EVs. What you have here is essentially what you call a self-charging hybrid. The common term used these days is strong hybrid and that's only a term that's used in India because we've already got mild hybrids which don't actually add considerably to the range. But with a self-charging hybrid, as the term suggests, you've got a battery 
at the back and you've got an engine up front and it's the engine's juice that is essentially powering up the battery without needing an external charging source like you would in an EV or in a plug-in hybrid. Now, plug-in hybrids haven't really been launched in India and uh, I don't think there's any plan to from any car maker. So, with plug-in hybrids, you get a much bigger battery pack, not as big as a one you would get with a pure EV, but it's still big enough to go on EV power alone for a considerable distance. This isn't one of those cars. Yes, you do start off in electric mode, where up until at least 60 kilometers per hour, you're kind of just running on battery juice alone. And it's as quiet as an EV, it's as refined as an EV. Uh, and with the exception of that surge of torque that you feel from the full might of the lithium ion battery and the electric motor, this does possess the mannerism of an EV. Another refreshing change of pace is seeing digits like upwards of 812 kilometers flashing on the dashboard here um, in terms of range, which is not something you're going to find in any EV presently sold. So, how does all this tech work? Up front, you've got a 1.5 liter VTEC petrol engine, the same as the one found in the standard petrol Honda City. And in terms of bore and stroke, it's absolutely identical but it's running what's called the Atkinson cycle, which means instead of being paired to a standard CVT, this one gets a single transmission unit, which just has one gear and uh, essentially sends power to the electric motor, which then powers the front wheels. That's what happens in what's called the hybrid mode. There's also an engine mode, which again, as it suggests, once the hybrid battery is completely depleted of all charge you get the engine to directly power the front wheels locking the clutch and using only that one gear now in the past i have to admit cvts have been my least favorite component of hondas and they've made what are otherwise perfectly great cars slightly less fun to drive because there's a pronounced rubber band effect and it's like the transmission is desperately trying to keep up with your throttle inputs. So if you pedal to the floor, you're going to hear a bit of a whine. And from then on, it's just the CVT trying to match the revs and almost always failing to do so. Now, I've said this before. Yes, it is a bit sad that it doesn't get a few trinkets, especially wireless charging, wireless Apple CarPlay, etc. And of course, ventilated seats, which in a tropical country, practically at this point, it's a must. But it does have pretty nifty ADAS or Advanced Driver Assistance System, which includes lane departure warning, and a system which keeps the car inside a particular lane and it's you know you turn it on and it's a little tricky on curves like these and Honda has advised a full hands-on approach but on the highway you know it does keep you in the middle of a lane which is a great safety feature because sometimes people have a tendency to doze off it's also got collision mitigation, which means through that camera, radar sadly is not legal in the country, but through that device mounted in the center of the windshield, it is on the lookout for obstructions ahead. And in case you're unable to brake, it does it for you. This is also applicable through the adaptive cruise control, which allows you to set the distance between your car and the object ahead with the cruise control automatically helping bring the car to a, well, not to a halt, but slowing it down based on the distance between the car and the object, another car up ahead, which is again, a great safety feature. The steering actually, in case you're wondering, is relatively heavy. Hondas have always been particularly fun to drive and that's never really changed with the city. And, uh, 
that's really not something you're going to get with electric vehicles at least in the range of this car they tend to be extremely light and offer absolutely no feedback whatsoever so really from an enthusiastic driving pov this wins again because like i said it was badge the rs in thailand honda has thankfully taken note of this little issue and they have circumvented that with this transmission system so essentially there are no buttons to press to switch into a sport mode or anything like that you know so when you floor it you hear a certain sound see it sounds like you're shifting gears so it does feel like you're going through the cogs which isn't a privilege you can experience in EVs so for petrol heads this is a bit of a boon because uh, even though you get the efficiency and the robustness of a CVT this is still mimicking the behavior of a torque converter so you kind of do feel like you're going through the motions if you're wondering the paddle shifters are in any way connected to that they aren't because uh, although they are in other Honda CVTs in this case it's just to control the level of regenerative braking so you take your foot off the pedal and automatically you experience a level of regenerative braking but you can increase that so suddenly the brake force seems stronger there's also a b mode in the transmission here in case you're going downhill like this where it remembers your regenerative braking inputs so it kind of applies force in a way that mimics engine braking it's all very artificial but it's still very clever and it works so let's do the math for a bit keeping the hybrid the diesel and the Tata Nexon EV Max in mind. With the current petrol and diesel prices as of shooting this video today in Maharashtra, the running cost per kilometer for the hybrid comes down to 4.1 rupees per kilometer. For the diesel, it's not too less, it's around 3.92 per kilometer. And for the Tata Nexon EV Hybrid, it's actually just 1 rupee per kilometer which means the EV in terms of running costs pretty much blows both of them out of the water. But what you have to keep in mind is that even though the Nexon EV Max is good for about 240 kilometers, it's still not ready to take on the great outdoors and this car is. With a full tank of gas in a hybrid car like this, the world is your oyster and you get great fuel economy in return. Then there's the fact that while this may not have the performative prowess of a pure EV in terms of just the way it delivers torque, this is still a very well-finished car with extremely quality interiors. Everything's been lavished with fine soft-touch materials, including the steering. And that's just not something you're going to find in the Nexon EV Max. For anything a little more plush, you're going to have to shell out a lot more money. So essentially, it's a fairly good compromise because, let's face it, you've got some pretty advanced driver assistance systems here, including collision mitigation and lane assistance. So things do suddenly start to look very good for this car. And that's probably why, according to Honda, for the next 10 months, the City Hybrid is already sold out. And that's not all, which is why Japanese cars traditionally have been very reticent to enter the EV space particularly in the Indian context where brands like Maruti Suzuki feel like there isn't a strong enough demand. Now, in the coming months, we're going to see a car that is jointly developed with Toyota and Maruti Suzuki called the Grand Vitara and its twin, the High Rider, which are going to be launched very soon, which are both strong hybrids. And according to Maruti Suzuki, 2,000 units have already been booked out in the span of a month. We've talked about the performance, we've talked about the tech in this car, but we haven't yet addressed the elephant in the room, and that's the price. With a 43% GST inclusive price tag, hybrids in this country still tend to be very expensive, and the Honda City Hybrid is no different. With a 19.5 lakh X showroom price tag, it commands a considerable premium over the petrol and diesel counterparts of its breed. And even the top end 
ZX diesel comes in at 15.43 lakhs, which is considerably less. Then there's the fact that an EV like the Tata Nexon EV Max with an 18.53 X showroom price tag is also competing in the same space. And that's a zero emission car, which runs purely on electricity. So it looks like the Honda City Hybrid is besieged from both sides because the acquisition costs are higher than those of petrol and diesel cars, and the running costs are higher than electric cars. But what if we were to switch that equation around and take a look at it once again? You see, if we were to look at the acquisition costs of this car, they are lower than those of EVs, and the running costs are considerably lower than those of petrol and diesel cars, which kind of puts hybrids, especially cars like these, at a sweet spot. Given how keen the government is to reduce the oil import bill, I highly doubt that hybrid tax brackets are going to be altered anytime soon. So they may not pose a direct threat to standard petrol or diesel cars because the price cap is so high. But with fuel prices at an all-time high and vast segment gaps in the EV space, locally manufactured hybrids have a chance to drastically alter the automotive landscape. Hybrids, after all, are the best of both worlds and clearly, they're here to stay.